Welcome everyone, thank you for joining. Um, this is going to be the first talk of the first day of the Embedded Linux conference. And I am already going to start to fill your brain with a lot of Ethernet driver information. Um, so I'm Maxim, uh, I've been working at Bootlin for the past six years now. And in my job, I've been mostly working with um, Linux uh, drivers for Ethernet controllers, uh, Ethernet file controllers, switches, and so on. And today, um, I'm going to talk about um, what's inside uh, an Ethernet driver. Uh, when we talk about Ethernet, uh, it's something that we see a lot nowadays on embedded devices. And an Ethernet controller is not something that is considered as simple. Uh, it's going to be in charge of, of course, sending and receiving data, but you can do much more with that. Uh, and in the end, when you write a driver for that, you'll end up uh, having to interact with a lot of various infrastructures within the kernel in order to configure a lot of the different possibilities that your hardware can offer. So the, the goal of this talk today is to kind of take a tour together of what you find in such a driver. Uh, it will help you as a user, as a developer, uh, if you want to learn more about what's inside and how to configure everything, how to debug maybe, uh, you are going to maybe see something that looks familiar if you have already uh, written such a driver, but hopefully you will learn one thing or two. Um, I will tend to focus on what we find specifically in embedded systems. Uh, there is nothing really specific about embedded Ethernet drivers. Uh, maybe uh, uh, besides the fact that you usually find it inside an SOC, so a system on a chip. Um, but everything that we're going to see here will still apply for any kind of Ethernet controller. It can be like a PCI card that you're going to plug in your computer. It can be um, a network controller for some data center machines uh, that go really fast. Uh, whereas usually in embedded systems, we go a bit slower than that. But all what we can see can still apply here. Um, so let's first take a look at what's inside a typical Ethernet controller. So this is a very, very simplified view of what you find in there. Um, so in your Ethernet controller, you have, uh, first of all, in the, the middle, uh, it's a, a Mac. I don't know if you can see my, my pointer. Uh, the Mac is really about the 802.3 standard, so the Ethernet part uh, of sending and receiving frames. So the frame will have a dedicated size. Uh, that's called the MTU. Uh, when you start sending a frame, you need to start uh, to send a bit of special data before actually sending your actual payload. That's called the start of frame. You need to deal maybe with collision if you have a half duplex link um, and maybe do a bit of flow control in order to make sure that the device you are talking to, that's often referred to as the link partner, uh, is capable of receiving what you want to send or maybe you need to slow down a little bit or stop transmitting for a while for the device on the other end to uh, keep up with the pace. Um, the Mac is also in charge of making sure the link stays established. So keeping sending what's called an idle word on the link to make sure that the link uh, is reported as active on both sides uh, of your, uh, your cable, basically. Uh, so that's really the, the heart of your uh, Ethernet controller. But there is much more than that. Usually you have queues within your Ethernet controller uh, so that you can, like, queue a packet while one is being sent already, uh, knowing that nowadays we have pretty powerful CPUs and they are capable of uh, generating data much faster than one, what we can send. So uh, if you have especially a very slow link, like 10 or 100 megabits per second, it can take a while to send the packet and you might want to uh, keep pushing things in your queue while the other packets are being sent. Um, you of course have interfaces that goes in and out of your controller. So you have one that goes towards the outside world, that's called the MII, Media Independent Interface. Uh, usually it's connected to an Ethernet file on embedded devices. But again, I say usually because the file can be embedded within your ISOC. There can be no file at all if you do some fiber, for example. And on the other end of your controller, you have an interface towards the CPU, so your, your host uh, CPU. Uh, it can be through an internal bus on your ISOC, it can be through a PCI link, and you will have DMA to do the, the transfer uh, of data between your, your controller and your host. So we are going to talk about that. And finally, uh, maybe the most uh, important thing would be everything else that you can find. And this is what's make, uh, what makes every controller different. You will find uh, a lot of other engines within your Ethernet controller that can do extra thing. Uh, you can timestamp your packet when you send and receive them. 
Uh, you can do a bit of filtering at the hardware level in order to drop the traffic that you don't want, or maybe to uh, slow down the pace on the transmit side, or to do the queue management, or to offload some things in the hardware. For example, checksum computation is a good example. Uh, in the, the data you send, you have some checksums at the uh, IP level, at the TCP level, and some hardware can compute the ch these checksums on the fly or check them when you receive your data. So a lot of these uh, engines exist in various hardware, and it makes, in the end, Ethernet devices very configurable. Uh, and this is the main idea of this talk. Uh, we have lots of things we can configure. How do we do that, and how do we interact with that uh, with the, the rest of the, the kernel? So I'm going to focus a lot on the internal kernel structures. I will try not to bore you too much with code, and instead I will try to pinpoint the important structures, the important uh, API bits uh, that you will need to access in order to implement what you want. And I will give a lot of links towards documentation because in the end it's the, the most important thing. Um, the backbone of a typical Ethernet driver is going to be the same as for any network uh, controller. Uh, you need to provide from your driver a struct net device. Uh, that's going to be the, yeah, the backbone of the driver. So you will create it in your probe function for your driver. Uh, you will do some initialization of your net device, and at some point you will register it towards the network subsystem. Uh, once you have registered your net device, it will become an interface from the user space point of view. So when you run IP link show or maybe IF config, uh, if you haven't moved away from that tool yet, uh, it will show you interfaces uh, that they, they have a name and they have an index, the IF index. Uh, these are net devices within the kernel. Um, you can have hierarchies uh, within your net devices, so you can actually build trees of net devices. For example, when you create a bridge in Linux, you will have multiple interfaces and you will uh, bridge them together through another net device. Um, so you have a notion of parent and children interfaces. Uh, we call that lower and upper interfaces. Um, you allocate your net device, there are lots of helpers that exist for that. Uh, but for Ethernet in particular, there is a variant of the allocation helper that's called the alloc etherdev MQs. It will allow you to allocate your net device for your Ethernet controller with a few extra things that will make them more suitable for an Ethernet a net device. Uh, for example, you can specify the number of queues you have within uh, your controller. And this function will do the allocation and at the same time allocate all of the resources that are going to be needed to handle these queues. And you also pass a private size uh, that's going to be um, the size of the pointer you want to have to keep your what's called private information. So basically everything that's going to be used only by your driver to keep its own context. And you get that with the netdevprev function. Uh, an important thing that I want to stress out uh, with that is once you have called register netdev from your driver, from that point on, it becomes visible to the user. So the user can start configuring it. It might want to start using it right away. So everything must be ready in terms of resource allocation uh, at that time. Um, to continue with this net device, um, like any other drivers, I don't know how familiar you are, you are with uh, driver development in the kernel, but the way a driver typically works is that you will provide a set of callbacks or operations. Um, and it's going to be basically the entry points of your driver. Your kernel will call into these functions to ask your driver to do something. A typical example is a callback that will be used uh, to transmit a packet. The kernel will ask your driver, can you transmit that uh, to the outside world? Um, in the net device, these are called net dev ops, and they are often referred to as NDOs. So if you see in the mailing list some discussion about a new NDO, we are talking about a new operation, a new callback within the net dev ops. Uh, there is only one that is mandatory, uh, which is the transmit uh, callback called NDO start exmit, basically to ask your driver to send something. Um, again, these net dev ops, they are really generic. So they, they are in the, the same set of operation exists for Ethernet devices, but also for Wi-Fi devices, for CAN devices, and so on. Um, they all use the same set of operation, and you are not expected to implement all of them, but at least implement the one that's going to be used to send data outwards. Um, again, you specify them before you register your device. Um, so now we've seen the important bit, the net device. Um, we are going to, so to, to start talking about the data pass. So um, how do you send and receive actual data? Uh, that's one important part of your driver, and it's actually the one thing that we ask you to do in your driver. How do you send and receive things? 
Um, we are then going to talk about the control plane, so how do we configure the driver. But first, let's see how do we send and receive data. Um, before we dive into the actual functions that we use to send and receive, um, one important bit is how do we represent the data that we want to send and receive. Uh, within Linux, we have the, the notion of an SKB. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of an SKB before. Um, it's short for socket buff. Um, so it's the, the data structure that's used in order to store a packet within its uh, traversal of the kernel. So it's created either when you want to send a packet uh, from the user space socket API, so you unqueue some data into a socket from your user space program, and here in the kernel side an SKB will be created, and it will traverse the whole networking stack, uh, going through all of the encapsulation processes, and it will end up at your driver, and your driver will be asked to send that SKB outwards. On the other end, when you receive data, your driver will create the SKB and it will push it to, uh, towards the, the network stack. And the network stack will decapsulate every layer to see who is interested by that data. Um, the internal structure is a bit complex. Uh, we have data and metadata. Uh, the data, the actual payload that we want to transmit, uh, it's actually handled through four pointers. Um, these pointers will point to a, an area in memory uh, that's going to contain our actual payload. And this payload is stored into the, the, oops, uh, the data section uh, here. Well, I cannot even see where I'm pointing here. Um, you have some headroom and tailroom uh, at each side of your actual data. This is because when you want to encapsulate, for example, your, your traffic, well, you are going to actually uh, take some space within the headroom and turn that into data. You are going to put data in front of your packet. Uh, in other cases, you might want to put data at the end if you want to add some kind of a checksum or extra data in the end. And then you have another area that is going to be the shared information uh, that's going to be used by various uh, players within the stack. Uh, for example, when you are going to timestamp your packet, you will uh, put that information in there. Um, and then you have other pointers to refer to where are all of the headers uh, from your packet, where is the MAC header, transport header, and so on. But these, you don't really uh, need them in your driver, actually. You just care about the actual payload you want to send or the payload that you just received. Um, so very important part of uh, the, the hot paths because this is actually what you're going to send and receive. Uh, you create it in your driver with build SKB and you free it when you don't, no longer need it. Uh, especially on the transmit side. Um, so uh, usually the data section is what you are going to map uh, in DMA. Uh, so you are going to create a DMA mapping and then create a descriptor for that mapping and then send that into your controller. Uh, the same on the receive side. Uh, the DMA mapping in itself uh, in some platforms can be uh, the bottleneck. So there is a kind of new API that was created that's called page pool. And the page pool API is uh, designed to uh, keep a pool of memory that you need to use for your network traffic for your controller, and it will keep the page uh, the pages mapped. So we, we don't use really a granularity of uh, the payload of the data, we use a granularity of a page in the kernel to store the data, uh, and it gives us quite a, a lot of leeway in order to do the memory management. Um, and it's usually faster uh, because you can do recycling very easily with that. Um, the page pool is a prerequisite if you want to use XDP, which has, I'm going to talk about a bit later on. Um, so if you want to use XDP in your driver, you need the page pool API to be used. Uh, but you can also use page pool without XDP, and usually you will still have some kind of performance improvements. Um, some documentation can be found uh, in, in this link. Okay, so now let's talk about um, how you transmit some packet uh, outwards. Uh, so I said there is an NDO for that, the static smith, uh, and the kernel will call that callback when it will ask your driver to send something. It will pass as a parameter the net device that represents your device and the SKB that you need to send. Um, the, the typical process for that is that, okay, you will take the SKB, create a DMA mapping, or uh, use the page pool API for that, create a descriptor, and then uh, unqueue that descriptor into the transmit queue for your device. Um, in some cases, uh, you will have multiple transmit queues. I will see why this is important. Uh, and in that case, you have a function that you can call SKB get queue mapping to know on which transmit queue do you want to send that. Because the decision of on which queue your SKB should be put uh, is going to be done by the kernel or in some cases by user space through various mechanisms uh, like TC, for example, or MQ prior that I'm going to talk about later on. 
And then what happens is that the packet goes into the queue for your controller. When your controller at some point is going to send the, the packet, and when the packet has been sent, the controller will typically raise an interrupt saying, okay, I have sent that packet. You can now uh, release any memory that was associated with it and free all of the resources. That's called the completion for a TX packet. Uh, so once you have the completion, so that is going to be notified by your controller, you can free the SKB. Uh, there are a couple more things that you can do. Uh, it's not mandatory, but it's heavily recommended. Uh, when you uh, put a, pack in, a packet in the queue, you can indicate to the kernel how many bytes did you put in the queue. And when you release uh, the packet, when you are in completion, you can say to the kernel, I have released these many bytes from the queue. And this will help the kernel to be a bit smarter when it comes to traffic pacing. I don't know if you ever heard about the buffer bloat problem, uh, which is a typical problem dealing with um, traffic globally in the internet that will be, uh, have a tendency to become high latency when you have a lot of data that is going through. And this is because all of the actors, the individual nodes in your, uh, in your link uh, will have such queues and buffers all over the place. Um, and so when you make the kernel aware of what is currently inside your queue, the kernel can, for example, start um, deciding to stop and queuing traffic even though you still have room in your queue, but just to, to keep that amount of queued traffic uh, small uh, to guarantee that you can have uh, low latency traffic. So it's a good idea to add that in your drivers. Um, on the receive side, it's a bit different. On the receive side, we have what's called NAPI. I don't know if you ever heard about NAPI. Uh, NAPI means NAPI. Um, it used to mean new API uh, when kernel 2.4 was out, so it's no longer new. And so the new API doesn't stand anymore. NAPI just means NAPI. And the idea is that you want to process packets uh, without uh, relying on interrupts uh, to drive that. Uh, because what typically happens is that you will have a, an interrupt that's going to be raised by your controller every time you receive a packet. Um, so that's fine. But what's going to happen if you have a lot of traffic and especially small packets is that you are going to have your interrupt and then trigger the processing for your single packet, start processing it within the network stack, and then you're going to get interrupted by the next one. And the, the processing is going to start for that next one, and then you are again going to be interrupted, uh, and so on. So this uh, in itself will hurt the performances a bit. So the principle with NAPI is that when you receive one packet, the first one, you are going to start processing it, but keep the interrupts disabled. And instead of manually processing the packet, you're going to call within your interrupt controller NAPI schedule. Uh, and then the kernel will call into a function that you have registered, that's going to be your poll function, and it will say, okay, can you process the next 50 packets, that's called the budget, for example, while keeping the interrupts disabled. Uh, so you process it and then you see if there is more things in the queue that you can process. So you process the next 50 uh, packets. You don't want to do that forever. So at some point when the budget is exhausted, you re-enable the interrupts and you again uh, start uh, going into an interrupt-driven mode. And this will avoid all of these interferences. Uh, this is not batch processing. Uh, batch processing would mean that you need to wait for n packets to be received before you start processing these. Uh, NAPI is not that kind of mechanism. If you want to do batch processing, you have to do it at the hardware level with a mechanism that's called interrupt coalescing, where it's actually your controller that's going to start keeping packets in the queue before notifying you that there is something to process. Uh, NAPI is just about avoiding all of these interferences from the interrupts. Um, NAPI also works with uh, TX. So in the polling loop that you will have, you can also process the completions uh, for the transmitted packets. And what you can also do if you have multiple queues, especially multiple receive queues, is have one NAPI instance per queue, uh, allowing you to have more control uh, over that mechanism here. Um, on the data paths, so transmit and receiving, you might also need to do something else that's going to be the time stumping. Um, so uh, it's useful for something called PTP. I don't know if you've ever heard of PTP before, uh, the precision time protocol, but time stopping can be used for other applications. Uh, what you want is get information of exactly when a packet left your controller. And you can only get that information from the hardware itself because from the software level, you know when you unqueue the packet, but you don't really know when it's actually going out. So in some cases, the hardware can tell you exactly when the packet went out. And the same thing for the um, ingress side, the receive side, the, the, the controller will actually timestamp the packet when it receives it before it puts it into the queue. 
Um, and so it's going to be up to your driver to, while it's processing the incoming or outgoing traffic, to grab that information about the timestamp related to that event. So for the receive side, it's pretty simple. Okay, you get, you grab your packet from your queue, either from the interrupt, uh, well, the first NAP people or the subsequent ones. Uh, and then you also grab the information from your controller, what is the timestamp associated to that packet, and you put it in the, sh in the, the shared information of your SKB. And it's easy because when you receive the packet, you know that you also have the timestamp available. On the transmit side, it's different because you are going to unqueue a packet, but it's not been sent yet, so you don't know what is the timestamp of the transmission of the packet. So you have to wait for the transmit completion, so for the driver to notify you, okay, I have transmitted that packet, in order to retrieve the timestamp. And what it means is that you need to keep a reference to the packet that you sent uh, that were timestamped. Uh, so you need to keep a queue of SKVs that were sent, and that needs timestamping. Uh, but it's a bit even more complicated than that. You need to check whether or not you need to timestamp a given packet. And that information comes from the kernel. So we'll have a flag that you check in your SKB that's going to be, um, do we need to timestamp it? And if so, I am timestamping it by stating the uh, in progress uh, bit in your SKB. Uh, and then uh, in any case, if you are or not responsible for timestamping it, it's a good idea to call the SKB takes timestamp so that we can fall back to software timestamping if we cannot do it in hardware. Uh, and when you have the timestamp available, uh, you can actually call that function uh, having put the timestamp into the SKB. So what's happening here is that you are sending a packet, you keep a copy of it, you put a timestamp in it, and you send that copy of the packet that was sent back to the kernel, and it's going to go back to user space, uh, and the user space will have the information of what is the timestamp uh, associated to that data that I sent. Uh, you need to keep in mind that sometimes it's a bit more complex than that. Uh, take a look at the documentation because uh, in some cases on your link, uh, physical link, you can have multiple uh, actors that can do the timestamping. For example, the Mac, but maybe the Fi will do the timestamping and you need also hardware timestamping. Or maybe there is something else in the middle that can do the timestamping. So just checking at these flags uh, is uh, sometimes not enough. Uh, so in this documentation, it tells you how to gracefully handle that when you have multiple time stamping uh, actors on the link. Um, so that was about, I'm going to tell you about uh, how do we configure that uh, later on. So back to the queues, um, let's talk a bit more about receive and transmit queues. I said that uh, it's pretty common right now on, uh, on hardware to have multiple queues on the transmit and receive side. Uh, why is it important? Um, on the receive side first, uh, it can be interesting to have multiple receive queues if you are, for example, uh, dealing with an SOC that has multiple CPU cores. Uh, if you have multiple CPU cores, what you can do is actually um, associate each queue with a CPU core, uh, and therefore you can actually uh, try to parallelize the processing of the ingress traffic. Uh, it's a bit more complex than it seems because you don't just randomly assign an ingress packet to a queue. Uh, you need to uh, actually keep uh, some consistency uh, within, with regard to what you are unqueuing. For example, um, we, we are talking about flows, traffic that have the same source destination IP, source destination port, will often be consumed by the same application. And therefore, it makes sense to unqueue all of that always into the same queue. You are guaranteeing the ordering in that case and also the cache coherency. So the, the hardware itself needs to be a bit smart about how it's going to do the queue assignment. Uh, so you have two ways of doing that. You have what's called RSS, the receive side steering, where the controller will actually look at the headers of your packet, extract the important fields like the IP address and the ports, compute a hash of that information, and take the low, lower uh, bits of that hash to um, deduce the queue number. You are sure that uh, all of the packets that have the same IP and ports will have the same hash and therefore will go into the same queue. So you can configure your hardware to, um, to tell it how it should do the hashing. Uh, in some smarter hardware, you can actually steer the traffic. So actually say, traffic with this exact address and this exact port should go into that queue. Uh, and you, here you need some hardware that needs to be a bit more configurable in order to do that. Um, so the user space APIs to configure that are going to be either Eftool or the TC uh, API. There are other things that can do some offloading of that, but it's the main entry points. If you are not familiar with that, first take a look at uh, Eftool and TC uh, on how do you configure that. 
On the transmit side, it's a bit different because on the transmit side, we are in control about what we are sending. So we know in advance uh, where we should uh, unqueue the traffic. Um, there are, again, multiple use cases uh, that we can have. One of them is the what's called XPS uh, to assign, again, one queue per CPU core uh, to avoid here uh, having contention on the queue locks uh, so you can unqueue traffic on multiple CPU cores at the same time. Uh, and so here, this is where we are going to actually use the SKB gate queue mapping. So it's pretty easy to implement in your controller, much easier than the receive part. On the transmit side, you just take a look at what's the queue mapping for your SKB, uh, so because we know that in advance, and unqueue your packet in the right queue. Uh, you can do much more advanced things. For example, you can, if you have multiple queues, try to do some prioritization of the traffic. Uh, because the hardware usually have some kind of a scheduler uh, in front of the queues to decide from which queue it should and queue the next packet to be sent. Uh, and so sometimes it's configurable and you can have like a high priority queue and lower priority queues and everything that is in the high priority queue is going to be unqueued first and then the other ones. And you can go even further than that to implement uh, time sensitive networking uh, where you can have queues that have such a high priority that you can do a frame preemption. So basically you are in the middle of sending a frame you stop in the middle of that to send something else and then you resume from where you left. Uh, so you need dedicated hardware support for that, but it's something that's doable and all of that is configured through the queue configuration uh, with MQ Prio and TA Prio, which I'm going to talk about a bit later on. Uh, finally, on the, uh, like the hot path, the, 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 the data plane, we have something called XDP. I don't know if you heard of XDP before. Uh, so XDP is the ability to uh, run a BPF program, or an eBPF program rather, directly within your driver. The idea is that we want to run that BPF program to take a decision about what to do with the incoming packet as soon as possible. As soon as the packet arrives, we want to take that decision. And the sooner that we can do is actually, uh, the soonest we can do is actually within your driver. So in your poll processing loop, when you receive a packet, you can run a BPF program and that program will decide what to do with it. Modify it, drop it, forward it to the kernel stack, forward it to a dedicated socket with AFXDP, and so on. So this needs driver support. It's driver dependent. The first thing that you need is to use page pool for your buffer allocation. And then you need to implement two NDOs, uh, the BPF NDO to load the BPF program in your driver. And then uh, you need to modify your polling loop in order to run that BPF program when you receive the packet. And sometimes you can also have XDP at the TX level, at the transmit level, uh, in order to take a decision just before you send the traffic uh, or to do some redirection between ports. Uh, the documentation here, um, uh, there is a very good documentation and extensive by the Cilium project on uh, XDP and BPF in general. And you can also take a look at some example drivers uh, for embedded systems. Uh, the one that we consider the reference driver is usually MVNeta, which is a uh, driver for a Marvel platform. Uh, but it has uh, support for all of the XDP features that are going to be interesting. So that was about sending and receiving data. Now let's talk about how do we configure all of that. There are lots and lots of knobs that we can tweak in a typical driver uh, because we have so many features that we can uh, control. And uh, the way that we are going to control that uh, is a bit, well, not all over the place, but there are various types of APIs that we can use in order to do that. Um, so we saw that uh, yeah, we have lots of things we can do just when it comes to sending and receiving traffic. But another important bit would be reporting statistics about what your controller is doing. Like how many packets did you send and receive? Did you get errors? Did you get checksum computation errors? Can you get per queue statistics, uh, statistics in, at the Mac level uh, or in the internal engines and so on? Uh, you can do a lot of offloading usually. So uh, do you want to do the checksum computation in your controller or in software? Uh, do you want to insert the VLAN tag for VLANs in the controller or in software? All of that is configurable depending on what your hardware supports. Um, you can also configure, of course, the Ethernet specific uh, data, like what's the size of your MTU. Uh, do you want to force the link speed uh, at a given speed? Uh, if your controller is capable uh, of going from 10 megabits per second to 10 gigabits per second, in some cases you want to force the controller running at 100 megabits per second, so you have dedicated control paths to do that. Um, and an important thing is that some of the configuration operation needs to be serialized. 
so they are uh, protected by a lock that's called the RTNL lock. Uh, and it's a very global lock that serializes all of the network configuration for all interfaces, uh, avoiding some race conditions between multiple configuration paths that can run in parallel and sometimes do bad thing. Uh, but it's not because it's a configuration path uh, that it, need, it, it can go slow. Uh, some hardware uh, actually have bottlenecks on how long it takes to configure these, es especially if you are doing a lot of offloading, uh, you need to configure a lot of things in your classifier and so on in order to select the queue to unqueue the traffic on. Sometimes it takes a while to fill all of that data in all of your tables uh, within your, your controller. Uh, so you might also need to think about how long it's going to take to do the actual configuration operation. Another example is that if you can avoid it, try to avoid bringing the link down when you do the configuration uh, and then up again. Sometimes you have a choice, sometimes you don't, sometimes it says in your hardware. If you want to check, uh, change that specific setting, you need to first disable the link, change the setting and re-enable it. If you can avoid that, it will make things much faster, of course. In terms of entry points within your driver, there are lots of them. Um, we saw the NDOs, the net dev operations, like the backbone of the driver. There are other sets of uh, callbacks that you can register into your net device. Uh, on top of the NetDev ops, you can have the ETHTOOL ops. Uh, and as the name implies, these are configuration operations that are specific to Ethernet devices. Uh, they will really configure Ethernet specific stuff. So you usually don't find that in a wireless driver, for example. But you can have a lot of these. I'm going to talk about the various type of ops that you can have. Uh, one thing to remember is that you should always configure all of these before you register your net device. So, so make it uh, publicly, visi well, publicly visible to the user. Uh, there are other uh, configuration mechanisms. One of them is the notifier mechanism. Uh, so a notifier is uh, a way for your driver to indicate to the kernel, I am interested to know if there is any change of configuration in any of the network interfaces of the kernel, and I want to know about uh, configuration changes into this and this and this data bits, for example, when you are adding a new VLAN interface uh, that is bound to your uh, driver, you want to know about that. Or if you are going to do some bridging uh, with your interface uh, within the bridge, you want to know about that. So these are hooks that you are going to register and the kernel will call into that when there is a global configuration change, even though if it's not on your interface, it can still be called. Um, Switch there, for example, relies heavily on that. So it's for when you are writing a uh, driver for a, um, an Ethernet interface that's going to be part of a switch on your hardware. So some hardware have internal switches with multiple ports that, that are going to be exposed uh, directly uh, outside of your SOC. And in order to offload the bridging, so the uh, traffic forwarding between your local interfaces, uh, you will have to use a switch dev interface for that. Uh, there is a kind of legacy IOCTOL interface for drivers. Uh, so IOCTOL is a mechanism to do some uh, user space to kernel uh, communication. Um, and it used to be that your driver could implement specific IOCTOLs. So basically the user space would directly hook and send a message to your driver uh, to do some driver specific configuration. Uh, this is um, fading away. Uh, most of the IOCTOLs right now that are related to the networking are handled by the core. Uh, or by dedicated frameworks, uh, like the Phi framework. Uh, the last one that was uh, handled by drivers a lot was the timestamping configuration uh, to configure how your hardware should uh, timestamp the uh, outgoing or incoming packets, like all of these or just the PTP packets or uh, none of the, the packets. So this used to be done through a high octal hook in your driver, and now there is a new mechanism where they actually implemented uh, NDOs for that instead of relying on high octals. And finally, uh, a driver like an Ethernet driver can also interact with other subsystems uh, to do other things. Uh, for a good example would be a PTP clock. So uh, for the timestamping, you have an internal clock that will run inside your Ethernet controller that will do the timestamping. How do you adjust that clock? Well, you will register your, your, your driver to another subsystem that is the PTP clock subsystem and you will have uh, hooks and operations that are going to be specific to that subsystem but are still going to be handled by your driver. Uh, it can also be the case for the MDIO bus. Uh, if your driver is also an MDIO driver, uh, you will have to register a device for that. So for the NetDevOps, there are currently 92 defined uh, NetDevOps 
uh, you are not expected to implement all of these. Usually, a typical Ethernet driver implements between 10, 20, maybe 30, if you have a driver that does lots of things. Um, the most important one, I would say, is, of course, the start XMIT to transmit data. The open and close uh, operations, and they are actually mapping to uh, when you do a link up or link down from user space. When you set the link up, so you enable the interface, the NDO open is going to be called. And when this returns, your driver should be capable of sending and, re and receiving traffic. And same for the close. Uh, when the close returns, you should no longer be able to send and receive traffic. Uh, you have an NDO to gather statistics from your controller. Uh, you have an NDO to specify uh, the uh, receive mode. Uh, this one is also implemented in most drivers. Uh, this is to implement the infamous promiscuous mode. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Uh, this is when you want your driver to uh, not do any kind of filtering of the incoming packet. For example, if you receive an Ethernet frame that don't have a matching destination address, uh, one that doesn't match your local controller, usually the controller will drop the frame. It's not for me, I drop it. In promiscuous mode, you want still to receive that frame and uh, send it to the user, usually to do some Wireshark or something like that to analyze the traffic. Uh, so you have to configure your controller to not drop these frames that are not interesting. Uh, as I said, there are 92 of these and I'm only mentioning four. Uh, for the rest, I encourage you to take a look at these. Uh, they can be used to configure the virtual functions, a bit of bridging, flow control over Ethernet, VLAN filtering, and so on and so forth. And as I said, some are really not related to Ethernet at all, uh, because these NDOs um, are usually very generic uh, and they should apply to pretty much any net device. Um, Another important bit of uh, net device, and this is something that I struggled with uh, quite a few times, is the notion of net dev features. Uh, so this is actually an attribute that you're going to fill within your net device at any time to indicate to the kernel what is your device capable of in terms of offloading. So can it uh, compute checksums at receive or transmit time? Can it do VLAN filtering? Uh, can it insert or remove a VLAN tag automatically, or does it have to be done in software? Can it do RSS? Can it do flow steering? And so on and so forth. So all of these capabilities of your driver, uh, you need to expose them uh, to the kernel and in the, the, to the user in the end. And this is what you see when you run iftool-k. It will tell you everything that is enabled or not uh, in terms of uh, offloading support for your controller. Um, you have two main uh, attributes that you will set within your, uh, your controller. The features, so what is currently active uh, on your driver at any time. So by default, it will do checksum uh, verification and computation, for, uh, for example. And you have the HW features. So HW doesn't mean hardware. Uh, it means, uh, I think, human writable, host writable. It means the features you can change. Uh, if you take a look at iftool.k, it will tell you some features are changeable and some are fixed, so you are not able to change these. So the HW features is the one you can configure, actually. You can enable or disable at runtime. Um, you need to specify these in your driver to see, okay, I can do that and I can uh, also uh, do that or not do that. So I can do VLAN filtering or not, it, it is configurable. So you expose that to the kernel. And when the kernel wants to change the features, so either uh, from a user request or for some other events in the kernel that will uh, make uh, this feature broken, for example, the kernel will first call the fix features NDO in your driver to, um, for your driver to do some filtering of incompatible options, and then the set features to apply these. Um, so I strongly encourage you to take a look at the NetDev features documentation. Uh, it's actually pretty good. Uh, you can feel that the person who wrote that faced the same problem as I was uh, facing. Uh, and um, yeah, it will tell you more about the features management and how uh, it can sometimes behave in a strange way. Um, let's now talk about iftool. That's, it's actually an important part of an Ethernet driver. It's all of the operations that your driver can provide that are really Ethernet specific. Um, so uh, it's not parameters, it's actually parameters, and they are accessible with the iftool uh, utility in user space. Uh, and the way it communicates between user space and kernel used to be through IOCTOLs, and now it's done through the Netlink uh, API. And so you will, again, need to set a dedicated set of ops uh, before you register your driver. Uh, all of these operations must run under the RTNL lock, so it's expected uh, that you run these with the lock taken. 
and there are around 70 different istool operations. Uh, if you want to see the, uh, some information about that, take a look at uh, this doc. So an example of what you can do with iftool, uh, the information that you can report and configure. Uh, statistics, uh, lots of uh, fine-grained statistics that your driver can expose that are not necessarily standard statistics, but really something that only your driver can provide. You can expose these with iftool. Um, you can use the iftool uh, hooks to configure the link parameters. Uh, for example, the user will tell you, okay, I want to uh, actually set the interface at 100 megabits per second and have duplex and no auto negotiation. Uh, all of these kind of parameters regarding the link are also configured via iftool. You can configure the classification. So when you receive traffic on which queue does it go, uh, you can use iftool for that, even though there are other interfaces. Uh, the RSS, so spreading the traffic between all of the queues based on the hash, uh, this is also something you configure with iftool, so you will actually assign some weights uh, on queues, for example, you will be able to do that. Uh, you can do channel configuration, so channel configuration is the mapping of queues to interrupts. Um, and you have, well, lots and lots of other things you can do. You can uh, configure the energy efficient Ethernet, uh, you can configure the interrupt coalescing if you want to do batch processing, uh, wake on LAN, uh, have information on SFP modules if you have some, uh, and so on and so forth. You can even do some register dumps uh, from iftool. Uh, so that's one of the main uh, API uh, for Ethernet devices. Uh, there exist also iftool operations dedicated to five devices, for example. Um, another uh, pass is going to be the TC. I don't know if you ever used TC before. It stands for traffic control. Uh, it's a tool that is uh, pretty hard to learn uh, that's going to be used in order to do some uh, traffic filtering, rate limiting. So um, I think shaping is rate limiting on the transmit side and scheduling is rate limiting on the receive side, if I'm not mistaken, or policing maybe. Uh, you can drop some traffic automatically and so on. And the main idea is that you have lots of things you can configure, like, uh, of course, queue mappings, but also a bit of firewalling, filtering, uh, packet modification on the fly uh, on both the transmit and receive side. And TC knows how to do that in software. But there are some things that you can offload to the hardware on powerful enough hardware. And so the main hook for that is, a, again, an NDO, the setup TC. And uh, this is the only entry point for TC, and you have to look at the type field that is passed as a parameter in order to know which kind of TC operation you want to offload. Is it queue configuration, maybe to do some time-sensitive networking with TA prior, or uh, traffic shaping with CBS, flower for classification, um, and so on. So if you want to look at the documentation, uh, well, look at the code. <laughs> there exists some documentation, but uh, as a developer, uh, for drivers, um, the documentation isn't that great and you would rather take a look at other reference hardware and other reference drivers to do that. Um, some other thing that is going to be pretty popular, well, that is pretty popular on SOCs for embedded devices is uh, having embedded switches. So when you have your SOC that have multiple ports and these ports can uh, act as a switch. So you can actually do some forwarding between the ports, uh, maybe some VLAN, uh, VLAN truck or VLAN tagging on the ports automatically. And you can sometimes offload that. So the, the hardware knows how to do that automatically. And the switch dev API is what you use in order to configure that offloading uh, of the switching operations. Uh, and it's based on notifiers. So you register some hooks in the kernel to, to uh, have information about, uh, is there a bridge? So are two parts of my switch bridged together? Uh, you get that information through notifiers. And when you, from your driver, you see that, you will configure actually the bridging to be offloaded. By default, when you write a driver for an Ethernet interface that's part of a switch, uh, when you initialize it, uh, the Ethernet interface should act as a standalone network interface. Uh, not as a part of a switch or whatever. You, don't, you shouldn't do any bridging by default. It should act as a standalone interface. And then you should rely on all of the bridging support in the kernel to configure the offloading. Uh, again, there are lots and lots of operations that you can do, um, adding into the forwarding database, the multicast database, uh, the VLAN tagging, and so on. All of that can be offloaded in your driver thanks to the switch dev API. So if you want to take a look at, again at the doc, go see the switch dev doc. Uh, but this is a notifier-based uh, API. It's a bit special uh, why I'm talking about that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to go fast. Uh, regarding PTP, I said that you can do some timestamping. 
In order to do some time stamping, you need an accurate clock. So there is a clock that runs within your Ethernet controller, and you might want to adjust that clock in order for that clock to be very precise, because the more precise and the more synchronized that clock is going to be with your system clock, the more accurate your time stamping will be. So you can provide through the PTP clock uh, subsystem some callbacks uh, in order to adjust the clock. You can adjust the frequency, or you can uh, offset the time by a few nanoseconds or set the current time. And all of these are going to be used by the Linux PTP uh, set of utilities uh, within user space to synchronize the clock within your uh, Ethernet controller that does the time stamping with the actual clock of your system, depending on uh, whether your system has a trusted clock called the Grandmaster clock, or you want to actually consider the one that is in your Ethernet controller as your master clock and so on. So you can do some clock synchronization and you need to specify callbacks to adjust it. Um, you have lots of other things that you can do in drivers that I don't have time to talk about, uh, but it behaves the same way as like if tool operations. You can do MacSec offloading, uh, which is like IPsec but at the Mac level. You can do um, IPsec offloading. Well, you can do TLS offloading. You can do data center bridging for QoS. Uh, all of these have dedicated set of operations that you can register in your driver. Uh, some final words uh, regarding the file support. Um, because it's embedded here uh, in the Linux conference, uh, usually on embedded devices, you have a dedicated file that will do the actual uh, modulation and transmission of the physical uh, data. Uh, so the file driver is not handled by your Ethernet driver. Uh, they have dedicated drivers, but you need to interact with the file driver. When the user sets the link up, you need to uh, notify the file that it needs to start uh, discussing with the link partner to establish the link. Uh, and the same when the link stops, you should tell the file stop uh, talking with the link partner and bring uh, the file down to save some power. Um, and then on the other hand, the file layer will notify the driver when there is something at the other end of the link. So the link becomes up because there is something else that was plugged on the other side. So there are two frameworks to interact with. FileLib, which is the framework to write file drivers, and it exposes a few helpers that you can use within your driver. Uh, in order to interact with the file, like start the file, stop the file, get the file uh, description and definition from the device tree. Um, it's not something that you should use nowadays in your driver. You don't really interact directly with the file subsystem right now. Instead, we use FileLink, which is another level of abstraction. It uses FileLink internally, but it gives you much more flexibility about the configuration of the link, because sometimes some file might want the link to be reconfigured entirely. They don't use exactly the same protocol when you are doing uh, one gigabit and 10 gigabits per second, for example. And so the file link will notify your driver, okay, the link has changed configuration. Can you adjust your parameters locally? Uh, and uh, file link also has the possibility for you to adjust the PCS. So now it's really down to the uh, hardware level of how do you send an Ethernet uh, frame? You need to encode it, and there is a dedicated block within your driver that does the encoding and decoding of the link, uh, of the data, sorry. Uh, and so in some cases, uh, you have dedicated IPs and dedicated drivers just for that part. And so you can interact with that uh, through FileLink. Uh, and in some other cases, the PCS is a component that is embedded within, within your Ethernet controller. But you can still write a driver in order to configure exactly that, that part of your controller. Some controllers even have several PCSs, and they will switch between the two depending on the link speed. And again, you can do that through the FileLink interface. Uh, some final words about uh, how do you contribute to all of that. If you want to write some drivers for Ethernet controllers, uh, you are going to have to deal with the networking uh, community of the Linux kernel. And there are a few things that you need to know about. For example, in the networking community, we don't comment like any other uh, community. We use a dedicated comment style uh, like this one. So you, you don't have to put the extra uh, empty comment line at the top. You don't have to write your comment in haikus. Uh, it's uh, uh, not mandatory. Um, regarding the viable definition, uh, they use what's called the reverse Christmas tree, which is a fancy way to say uh, when you are declaring your variables at the top of your function, you should order them from the longest line to the shortest line. It's just for the code to be pretty. Uh, Try to do that. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Uh, for example, if your definition depends on another one that is just above, it's OK if you break the reverse Christmas tree. But if someone comments on your code saying RCS, it's just OK. I have just not aligned my uh, definitions properly. If you want to contribute, uh, you need to send your patches to the NetDev mailing list. Uh, the NetDev mailing list works with two uh, Git trees, NetNext for the new features, 
and net for the fixes. So if you have a fix to send in net, a new feature in netnext. You need to know that netnext closes during the merge window of the kernel. So when there is the merge window ongoing, uh, you cannot send patches to the netnext mailing list, mailing list uh, in order to give the contributors a bit of, uh, of break time, especially the reviewers. Um, you need to know uh, when you send a patch, uh, which tree are you targeting, and you need to set that information in the subject of your, uh, of your patches. So there is the git command to do that. Um, and keep in mind that the networking mailing list is very fast-paced, uh, lots and lots of activities. Uh, the reviewers are doing their best to comment very fast, uh, and usually you have a reply within one day or two, and it can go even faster than that. So it's a very high volume. But if you can help with the review process, uh, this won't hurt the community. It would, it would be a good idea. If you want more information about the specifics of contributing to networking subsystem, there is this also uh, uh, documentation available. Um, and it's now time for questions. Uh, if, you, if we have time, I don't know. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. You are asleep already. It's the first day. <laughs> yes, there is a question. Okay, so the question is, how do we, uh, how would I suggest to investigate uh, errors like CRC errors or errors that occur within actually the controller? Uh, the first thing that we take a look at is the statistics. Usually there are counters within your controller that will tell you how many CRC errors there were, uh, how many packets were dropped because of a malformed frame, and usually it's the first thing to look at. Uh, then you can try running the same uh, traffic, but with promiscuous mode enabled, so making sure that the controller doesn't drop anything. And then you take a look with something like Wireshark or TCP dump at what is actually the, the shape of your traffic, what does it look like. And usually Wireshark will tell you if you have CRC errors and uh, we can investigate that way. Another question. Well, thank you for attending and I hope you will enjoy the conference. <laughs>